Let's make a platformer. The code is going to start getting long, so let's organize it using the tabs in Pico 8. We'll let this first tab hold our variables and move our draw code to the next tab. Control X to cut, then click on the plus sign and Control V to paste. We can name these tabs by putting a comment on the first line. Double dash to start the comment, and this tab will hold the update and draw functions. Now when we hover over the tabs, it will display their names and help us stay organized. I love it! Let's see what we have in our game so far. Control R to run. We just have our map and player being drawn. Next, we need to create some physics in the game. That sounds complicated, but we are already halfway there with our player variables about movement. The last physics variables we need to prepare is a force that pulls downwards, known as gravity, and a force that slows moving things down, known as friction. I'm going to set gravity to 0.3 and friction at 0.85. Now I've already played with these numbers to find what works best for me and my ninja dude. But I'll show you later how we can have a lot of fun with the physics in our games just by changing these variables. It's really easy to apply this gravity to our player. Let's just add the update function. And for now, just write player.y plus equals gravity. That's it. Now let's watch the player fall. Well, that worked, but he should stop falling when he hits the ground, right? In games, the term for one thing hitting, bumping, or crashing into something else is collision. So the player should fall and collide with the ground, which is our map tiles. So it's specifically called map collision. All right then, let's build map collision. We'll make a new tab just for collisions. Now you might have only used built-in functions so far, but we're about to make our own function. Functions are a way of writing code one time and making it available to be used many times. And since I know that the map collision will be used many times in our game, I want to write it one time as a function so it's easy to use again and again. We start by writing function, just like init, update, and draw. But this time, we can name it anything we want. You could even name it ice cream. But that might confuse us later, and it will definitely confuse other programmers. So it's a good idea to name it by describing what it does. This function will check if things collide with the map. So collide map is a good name. After the function name must be parentheses. Now, if the function is going to do something the exact same way every time, then parentheses are all we need. But this collide map function is much more complicated than that. It will need to change based on what game object we are checking, right? We only have the player right now, but we could make enemies or items or even magic spells, and all of them should be able to collide with the map, right? Let's see. It should also change based on the direction the object is moving. If the player tries to move right, then we only need to check to the right of the player. And if the player keeps moving right and comes to a wall, how will we know it is a wall? Well, Pico 8 has a cool feature in our sprite editor called flags. And we can turn flags on or off for each sprite we make. Each flag has a different number, and we can check the sprite's flag to know what type of sprite it is. So let's go to our map sprites and turn on some flags. This first one is number zero, and it can mean whatever we want. So let's make this flag mean can stand on and not fall through. So let's go to our sprite sheet, and any tile that we want to be able to stand on should have flag zero turned on. Cool. But in most games, platforms are special because we can stand on them and we should be able to jump up through them but we shouldn't be able to jump up through other tiles like the ground. So let's add another flag to tiles that cannot be jumped through, and that can be flag one. So platforms will only have flag zero 
and all the ground tiles should also have flag 1. Okay, now our map tiles are prepared for collision. Let's go back to our new function. Now that we know the three things the function will change based on, we need a way to give this function that information. What holds information? Variables. And here's what's awesome about making our own functions. We can pass any variable to our function, and the function can even return a variable back. It's really easy to make this function ready to receive variables. We just name the variables inside the parentheses and separate them with a comma. So first, it needs a game object, and OBJ is a common abbreviation for that. Second is a direction, but we can use a short word like aim. Last is a flag number, to know which type of map tile we want to check collision with. Now OBJ actually needs to be a table of information about the game object, like the position and size. So let's make a comment to ourselves double dash obj equals table and needs x, y, width, and height. Just like our player has their variables organized in a table, we'll do the same thing with all game objects, and this comment will remind us that they all will need position x and y and size, width, and height to use this function. There's a lot of thinking ahead to do when you are making your own functions, but it's also okay to build them through trial and error. And it's definitely okay to error a lot. That's how you get better at it. And coding functions will get easier the more you make them. Now this function needs to do something with these variables to figure out if our game object collides with the map. The first thing I'm going to do to make the code easier to read is create local variables. By writing local before a variable name, we are telling this program that these variables are limited to this function only, so they won't be confused with variables outside the function. All I'm doing here is taking the values out of the object table and saving them to a local variable. And now we can just write x, y, w, and h without needing to write the table name every time. That's all. Now here's how this map collision is going to work. We are going to create an invisible rectangle just outside of the object sprite. Then we will do some simple math to find the four corners of that rectangle. And finally, check each corner to see if any of them are on a map tile. All we need to make a rectangle are the positions of two opposite corners. And like anything else that has a position on the screen, each corner has an X and a Y. By knowing where those two corners are, we can figure out where the other two corners are easily. Watch this. Let's name the first corner position x1 and y1. Then the second corner position will be x2 and y2. Ready for some pretty awesome geometry logic? If this point is on x1, and that's just the number of pixels from the left, then look, this corner is the same number of pixels from the left, so it's also x1. Can you figure out the rest? Let's see. If this is x2, then this corner is also x2. If this is y1, then this corner is also y1. And if this is y2, then this corner is also y2. There we go. From only two corners, we mapped out all four corners of a rectangle. Now we just need to give these variables actual numbers to be the correct positions we want to check. That will depend on the direction the object is moving, which we called aim. So let's check what aim is set to like this. If aim is set to left, then do something here. Else, if aim is set to right, then do something here. Else, if aim is set to up, then do something here. Else, if aim is set to down, then do something here and end. Aim must be one of those, or this function won't work. So let's leave ourselves another comment at the top. Now let's use that sweet geometry again to figure out where to put the rectangle based on the object's position, x and y and the object's size, width, and height. 
if the object is moving left, then let's set our rectangle a little to the left of the object, because that is where we need to check if the object will hit a map tile or not. Remember, x1 and y1 will be the top left corner, and x2 and y2 will be the bottom right corner. x1 is the object's x, but minus one pixel. y1 is just y, because it is the same distance from the top. x2 is x, because it is the same distance from the left, and y2 is y, plus the object's height, but that's one pixel too far, so we take one away. I'll write the rest of these for each direction quickly, but I highly encourage you to go over these again and even draw them out on a piece of paper until they make perfect sense. If you get stumped, just ask a question in the comments. And as always, you can read a more detailed explanation on nerdyteachers.com. Just follow the direct link to this lesson's page in the description. All right, we are almost there. We are going to use two built-in Pico8 functions that work really well together. fget will compare a sprite number's flag with the flag number you give it, and will be true if they match, or false if they don't. The flag number we want to check will be given to this collide map function, so that's taken care of. But how do we know what sprite number to check? We use the other built-in Pico8 function called mget. And that takes any coordinate on the map and gives the map tiles sprite number. So you'll often see these two functions working together, with mget tucked nicely inside of fget. There's just one thing we need to do before giving mget our rectangle's position. mget works with tiles, and our x's and y's are in pixels. So let's just convert pixels to tiles by dividing by 8. x1 equals x1 divided by 8. Make sense? But we can shrink that to x1 divide equals 8. And that does the exact same thing. So we just divide the others by 8 too. Now our final bit of code in this function will do the actual checking if any of our four corners is touching a map tile based on the flags we gave them. If fget parentheses then give it the sprite number found by mget parentheses and check it against the flag. And we will do this four times to check each corner. Control D duplicates the line. And now we give mget the correct positions using our x's and y's. The first corner is x1, y1. The next corner is x1, y2. The next corner is x2, y1. And the last corner is x2, y2. Then I just change the other ifs to ors, and when we read this, you'll understand why. So, if corner one is a map tile, or corner two is a map tile, or corner three is a map tile, or corner four is a map tile, then return true. And that is how our function passes a variable, in this case true, back to wherever in our code we ask this function to run. But if none of those are true, then we want to return false. So we write, else return false, and end this whole check. Pretty cool stuff. I bet you didn't think we would be using so much geometry, right? Well, that's it for preparing our physics and map collision. And the next video, we will finally get to build and play around with some awesome player movement. And if this video made perfect sense to you, that's fantastic. You can try checking out other games' collision functions and see what they did. But if you are still confused by anything here, please watch it again, make sure you understand all the words and symbols, try drawing it out for yourself, or ask us or someone you know for help. We are Nerdy Teachers, and by subscribing, you are telling us you want more.